Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 5 Beginning Quote It's about a kid like you were who believed. He was born believing, but as he grew, everything around him, beginning with his parents and sisters and teachers, everybody seemed to say that what he believed wasn't so. Sure, they said they believed, and they prayed, and cried to God and Jesus Christ Almighty, but that was a few moments out of a couple hours in the church each week. So somehow he became two personalities, one as sincere as the other, and then three, because he could stand off and watch the other two. The reason was that he suspected maybe the people who didn't believe might be right that there was nothing to believe in. But if he accepted this and put down the beautiful, honest, good things, he'd lose, out, he'd lose out on all he could have gained if he'd never lost his belief in believing. Charles Mingus, Beneath the Underdog Section Choosing During my adolescence, often without realizing it, I was making important choices. Some influences in our early years are so clear that their effect cannot be denied. We may also unconsciously reject other influences as we go along. It is hard to say at any point how things will turn out. All the time, I was going to junior high school and getting into trouble, fighting on the block, listening to poetry, and talking with Melvin. Other strong forces were, were at work. Often they were contradictory in nature, and pulled me in different directions. This caused confusion and conflict later, until I learned to sort them out and understand what they meant. One of the most long-lasting influences on my life was religion. Both my parents are deeply religious, and when Melvin and I were small, my father often read to us from the Bible. My favorite was the Samson story, followed closely by David and Goliath. I must have heard those stories a thousand times. Samson's strength was impressive, as well as his wisdom and his ability to solve riddles put to him. Strength and wisdom. I still link the hero with my father in those terms. I liked David and Goliath because, despite Goliath's strength and power, David was able to use strategy and eventually gain the victory. Even then, the story of David seemed directed to me and to my people. When we were growing up, we went to church every day, or so it seemed. Back then, the Antioch Baptist Church was only a little storefront, where the faithful gathered. I belonged to the Baptist Young People's Union, the Young Deacons, the Junior Choir, and I attended Sunday school and worship services weekly. My father was the associate pastor for a long time. He liked to preach the sermon about the prodigal son, and as he preached, he really moved around in the pulpit waving his arms and beating the stand. He terrified me with tales of fire and brimstone, and how sinners and the unrepentant would end up in a lake of fire. He was a real, quote, burner. The whole family was involved in church one way or another, holding offices, singing in the choir, serving on the usher board, or other committees. I was very active as a junior deacon, and every third Sunday, the regular deacons gave us their chairs below the pulpit. We sat in their places and administered certain parts of the services, taking up the collection and leading the congregation in prayer, everything except delivering the sermon. I did it all. I even read the sick list and special messages, although I had difficulty with reading. None of the other junior deacons did any better, however. We were all pretty illiterate. If we were weak in reading, however, 
other activities compensated. I loved to act in plays because I had acquired a certain eloquence reciting the poetry that Melvin taught me. It was easy for me to remember a part after I had heard it once or twice. My activities in church led to music. My parents were so impressed with everything I was doing that they decided to have me study the piano, mainly as a good way for me to take a more active role in the religious services. I studied piano for seven years with some excellent music theorists and classical pianists. Looking back, I see that my friends and I were all in the same boat, heading for hell on earth and trying to reach heaven in church. Nevertheless, taking part in church activities and leading the services gave us a feeling of importance unequaled anywhere else in our lives. For years, our pastor, Reverend Thomas, had a sign on the pulpit, Prayer Changes Things. The congregation was encouraged to see prayer as the only way to salvation. If we had problems, sickness, accidents, financial difficulties, prayer was the answer. Everybody in church prayed with you, sharing a common purpose that relieved tension and had a cathartic effect. No other institution in the community provided such an outlet. At the time, the church was the only stable force in the black community. And while some people do not think it was very effective, it did offer a kind of permanence and stability to our lives. The church was always there, providing solace and hope. For me, the church was a source of inspiration that offered a countermeasure against the fear and humiliation I experienced in school. Even though I did not want to spend my life there, I enjoyed a good sermon and shouting session. I even experienced sensations of holiness, of security, and of deliverance. They were strange feelings, hard to describe, but involving a tremendous emotional release. Though I never shouted, the emotion of others was contagious. One person stimulated another, and together we shared an ecstasy and believed our problems would be solved, although we never knew how. James Baldwin has described this religious experience very well in The Fire Next Time. He writes about the excitement and ecstasy that can fill a church during the service. There is no music, he says, like that music, no drama like that drama of the saints rejoicing, the sinners moaning, the tambourines racing, and all those voices coming together crying wholly unto the Lord. Their pain and their joy were mine, and mine were theirs. They surrendered their pain and joy to me, and I surrendered mine to them. End of quote. Once you experience this feeling, it never leaves you. For a while, I thought of becoming a minister, but I gave it up when I studied philosophy in college. I began asking questions about the concept of religion and the existence of God. In trying to find God and understand him as a philosophical ex existential being, I began to question not only the Christian definition of God, but also the very foundation of my religion. I saw that it was based on belief alone, the soundness of which was never questioned. Because I eventually found it necessary to question and examine every idea and every belief that touched my life, I reached a kind of impasse with religion. Yet its impact on me continues in different ways. To this day, for example, I rarely use profanity. People who have come to know me often ask why. I can only say that profanity was never used in our home. If I had been caught using it, my father would have punished me. My mother and father always lived as Christians, and this extended to the way they spoke. When I think back on the meetings in that storefront, it seems to me that religion made an impression in a more important, yet less direct, way. It has nothing to do with a personal system of belief, 
but rather an awareness of what religious action can or ought to be. Something remarkable was taking place during every prayer service. When people in the congregation prayed for each other, a feeling of community took over. They were involved in each other's problems and trying to help solve them. Even though it was entirely directed to God and did not go beyond the meeting, it suggested how powerful and moving it can be to have a shared sense of purpose. People really related to each other. Here was a microcosm of what ought to have been going on inside, outside the community. I had the first glimmer of what it means to have a unified goal that involves the whole community and calls forth the strengths of the people to make things better. I am sure that is part of why I was drawn to religion, and why it offered so much to me then. At the same time, I was growing aware of a wholly different style of life that had nothing to do with religion. One of the reasons so many people found comfort and solace in church was that it provided, even though briefly, an escape from the burdens and troubles of everyday life. There was another way of life, however, that did not seem to find this relief necessary. From what I could see, this other life also had none of the worries and problems that beset ordinary working-class people. In our community, some people had achieved a special kind of status. They drove big cars, wore beautiful clothes, and owned many of the most desirable things life has to offer. Almost without trying, they seemed to have gotten things for which the rest of the people were working so hard. Moreover, they were having fun in the process. They were not forced to compromise by imitating white boys and going on in school. They succeeded in spite of the humiliations of the school system. As a matter of fact, they often won success at the expense of the very people who caused our troubles. They opposed all authority and made no peace with the establishment. In doing so, they became big men in the lower class community. This was the world of Walter Jr., my second oldest brother, who was always called Sunny Man in our family. When I was small, he often took care of me, and I looked up to him. By the time I was a teenager, Sunny Man was a hustler with a reputation as a ladies' man. To this day, he has never married. To be a hustler means to be a survivor. The brothers on the block respected him and called him a hipster, even in those days. When people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said I wanted to be like him. To me, Sunny Man was much freer than the rest of us. Compared with my father's struggle, the way Sunny Man lived offered much to my hungry eyes. My father's constant preoccupation with bills is the most profound and persistent memory of my childhood. We were always in debt, always trying to catch up. From an early age, the bills meant I could not have any of the extra things I wanted. I hated the words so much it made me cringe inside, just like the way I felt listening to Little Black Sambo and the Tar Baby stories. For me, no words on the street were as profane as the bills. It killed me a little each time they were mentioned, because I could see the never-ending struggle and agony my father went through trying to cope with them. It is a situation familiar to most people in the black community. In one of his letters to his father, George Jackson spoke for me. Quote, How do you think I felt when I saw you come home each day a little more depressed than the day before? How do you think I felt when I looked in your face and saw the clouds forming? When I saw you look around and see your best efforts go for nothing? Nothing. End quote. I know exactly what he meant.
My father always paid his bills on time. He might complain about them, particularly about the interest, but he paid. As I grew older, I would sometimes examine the bills he received, and I saw that in most cases the greater portion of the money was going to pay interest. If we bought something like a refrigerator, we wound up paying double the original cost. Sometimes the bills exceeded his whole paycheck. My father never mailed his payments. Melvin and I took them to the stores because he wanted the receipts stamped. He felt that if he mailed the payments, they might make a mistake not send the receipt, and charge him more. This had happened in the past. Every two weeks, or once a month, depending on when the payment was due, he would make out a list for us and arrange the money in separate envelopes, one for each store, with the receipts inside. Then when we returned, he would carefully check the receipts. For years, Melvin and I made the rounds of Oakland stores, paying bills for our father. I was still doing this when I was arrested in 1967. When I became aware of the effect of the bills on my family, I wanted to be free of them. It was more than the bills that disturbed me, however. We were in an impoverished state and I found it hard to understand how my father could work so hard, yet have so little. He was a jack-of-all-trades, carpenter, brick mason, plumber, no job was beyond him. He worked at two, and sometimes three jobs at once, and yet we never got ahead. After finishing one of his various jobs, he would hurry home and work around the house or in the garden and then go off to another job. We could not understand how he did it. Never a day to rest or relax, and never a complaint. I think the years of hard work are partially responsible for his poor health now. He was always a strong person, and never sick until his later years. When I was older, and had a chance to see how people in better circumstances lived, I saw that our difficulty resulted from the large number of people in our family. For years, all nine of us lived in three or four rooms, with little opportunity for privacy. Until I was eleven or twelve, I had to sleep with Melvin in the kitchen, and sometimes before that, in bed with my sisters. It never occurred to me that I could have a room of my own. Fortunately, there was a great deal of affection and humor among us all, but still it was hard. I see now that in those years the idea took root in my mind that we were suffering such hardship through our own fault. I equated the idea of the family with being trapped and plagued by bills. At an early age, I made up my mind never to have bills when I grew up. I could not know then that this determination would extend eventually to the point of not being married or having a family of my own. My fear of being hounded by debt led me down Sunny Man's Road for a while. When I saw how much he was respected on the block, I began to spend most of my time there, at first in the little gangs we had in school and at parties, but later in the pool hall and bars. For a long time, I was attracted to this way of life, until I discovered it was not what it seemed. That came later. Even though I was attempting to be like Sunny Man, I nonetheless admired Melvin and his educational achievements. Both avenues seemed to offer a way, but I could not know which road was best. I had seen blacks take the education road and get nowhere. 
Many of them returned to the block, scorning their years in school and cursing the white man for holding them back. Other blacks had apparently made it on the block, but ended up broken men, in prison or dead. There was no clear pattern to follow. It was hard to know what to do. This dilemma faces almost all young black men struggling to achieve a sense of identity in a society that denies them their basic rights. The black teenager, in his most impressionable and vulnerable years, looks around and sees a contradiction between society's expressed values and reality, the way things actually are. The sunny men of the community, who defy authority and break the law, seem to enjoy the good life and have everything in the way of material possessions. On the other hand, People who work hard and struggle and suffer much are the victims of greed and indifference, losers. This insane reversal of values presses heavily on the black community. The causes originate from outside and are imposed by a system that ruthlessly seeks its own rewards, no matter what the cost in wrecked human lives. This can be profoundly disorienting to a teenager trying to understand and define himself. Like adolescents everywhere, he wants an image to model himself after, and he becomes confused because there is such disparity between what he is taught and what he sees. Most adolescents in black communities expect no justice from school authorities or the police. The painful reality of their lives from childhood on reveals that the inequities they encounter are not confined to a few institutions. The effects of injustice and discrimination can be seen in the lives of nearly everyone around them. A brutal system permeates every aspect of life. It is in the air they breathe. In attempting to cope, the teenager seeks some kind of protection for himself in order to survive, some way of dealing with the contradictions that surround him. This usually takes the form of resistance to all authority. For many adolescents, it is the only weapon they have. Most of the time, their rebellion is directed against authority outside the home. But if there is no strong family support, it can disrupt their relationships at home. Even the closest families crumble because outside pressures are so relentless. To a certain extent, this was true for me when I was in junior high school. My rebellion was minor and never became a serious problem, though it caused friction for a while. Looking back, I see that it was a reflection of the confusion and sense of fragmentation I was going through, part of the process of finding out who I was. It was also the beginning of my independence. Everyone in our home shared the household chores. Mine were the usual ones, taking out the garbage and, after my sisters left home, washing the dishes, and cleaning the stove. I also had to trim the hedges around the house. My father supervised the outside, while my mother's domain was inside the house. I hated chores and always tried to escape them, pedaling away on my bike and leaving everything to Melvin. I often stayed away from home until late at night, even though I knew my parents would punish me when I returned. Sometimes I made up fancy stories to tell them, but nothing could save me from punishment. I preferred my mother's whippings. She was more gentle. But most of the time, my father did it. Another responsibility I failed to carry out was a paper route I had for a time. 
I spent all the money I collected and could not pay the bill. When the people who had paid money did not receive their papers, I had to give it up. This kind of resistance was due in large part to the need to assert myself as a separate person, apart from my parents. I was beginning to want to make my own decisions. Often, this independence took the form of avoiding responsibilities. At other times, it was more constructive. Ever since I can remember, I have hated to see anyone do without the things he needs. This attitude probably came from my father's influence and the ideas he expressed in church. Once, when I was about 15, I met a kid who had no food at home. This was one of those nights when I was staying out late, and I brought him home and woke up my parents, rummaging through the kitchen cabinets. When I told them the boy and his family needed food, and that we could share ours, they did not object, although they were angry about my staying out late. Another time, when Melvin was going to San Jose State College, he needed a car but had no money. I had a small savings account, about $300, and I gave him all of it. My parents teased me about giving away all my money, but at bottom they were proud of this example of family closeness. Other times, though, I showed my sense of closeness in ways they did not approve of. Whenever my sister Myrtle got stranded at a party or somewhere else, she always called and asked me to pick her up. I would wait until my parents were asleep and then swipe the car keys. I did this every time she asked me, and every time I got into trouble for taking the car because I was not old enough to drive. My parents never spared the rod when I was young. As I grew older, they punished me in other ways, but I knew they did it because they cared about me and wanted me to develop a sense of responsibility. I think, too, they admired my inter independence, even though it sometimes worried them. They must have known I was at a difficult stage of development. Most black parents are very aware of the conflicting and bewildering influences that surround their children, and they experience a deep anxiety over whether they will get into trouble with the law or at school. They understand only too well how the system works. The loving discipline exerted in our home was not lost on me, and when the time came, it stood me in good stead. End of chapter 5